one. It must be December because the Seahawks don't have very many healthy running backs left on their roster. How are they going to proceed moving forward? Rob Rang and I are going to break down the backfield situation on a Tuesday episode of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks, joining me for Tell the Truth Tuesday. My co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're in Japan, Switzerland, or you're in Montana. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. We've got a loaded Tuesday episode coming your way. As always, Tell the Truth Tuesday, dishing out some hot takes, some final takeaways from Sunday's win over the Los Angeles Rams. And we're going to take a look at the upcoming opponent, the Carolina Panthers. They're well under 500, but it's a team that has been playing better football as of late. Won't be an easy game at Lumen Field. We'll take a look at what's new with the Panthers heading into this Week 14 matchup. This episode is brought your way by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players if they score more or less than your Prize Picks projection. You can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. Now for your lead story here on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Every December, it seems like there's two constants in the Pacific Northwest. Obviously, you've got Christmas coming up on the 25th. Everybody's going to be excited about that. And the Seahawks have running backs dropping like flies. It feels like it's an annual tradition. And I know it is the position in the NFL, and really in football in general, where there's the greatest injury attrition. And yet, it feels like the Seahawks get hit especially hard this time of year. And that didn't change on Sunday, Rob, with... Ken Walker III and DJ Dallas going down with ankle injuries, their status up in the air. Travis Homer didn't even play. He's dealing with a knee injury. We talked to Rashad Penny yesterday. He's trying to make a miraculous comeback from surgery repair, a fractured fibula. Tony Jones Jr. is the only healthy back on the 53-man roster heading into this Week 14 game against the Panthers. And understandably, even though Pete Carroll downplayed the idea a little bit yesterday, they added a proven veteran to try to fill the fit the bill a little bit and give them some insurance in the backfield. Yeah, they brought in Wayne Gallman, um, who is a, a talented back. Uh, you know, was a highly regarded prospect coming out of Clemson a few years ago. Um, and of course, they still have two backs already on their practice squad, and Godwin Iguibuke, uh, and then Darwin Thompson. Um, I really like this addition of Wayne Gallman. To me, he is a is a physical back. He is a guy that doesn't have elite straight line speed, um, something that you might expect when you're coming out of Clemson. But at the same time, he runs hard he has experience as a return man as well i think that you combine gallman who has of course a great deal of starting experience at a perennial playoff contender in clemson and uh, of course what the seahawks already have in tony jones jr who i thought showed some really impressive flashes um you know when he was pressed into duty against the los angeles rams he played his college ball at notre dame so another team uh, and another player who is used to being in the spotlight. I think that Seattle's backfield is a little bit more solid than the national media might think. Yeah, it might be in better shape than most people realize at the same time. If you don't have Ken Walker the third for an extended period of time and Rashad Penny's already on the shelf, you are without two of the most explosive running backs in the NFL. That is a big deal. That impacts your offense. And DJ Dallas has been invaluable for this football team on special teams. The way that he got it out the second half the other day playing with what I've been told is a high ankle sprain, the way that he went out there and continued to run tough and pass protect and play on special teams uh, was extremely admirable. And Travis Homer, we know his special teams value, and he's played well on offense when he's had his chances. So that's still a lot of talent that potentially won't be on the field for the next week or potentially longer, depending on the severity of these injuries. I do like the addition, though, of the Wayne train. When you're going into week 14, it's really difficult to find much talent that's available in the free agent scrap heap. And Goldman wasn't signed for a reason because this guy is not – necessarily an explosive back as you mentioned this is not a guy that's gonna be hitting home runs like Rashad Penny and Ken Walker the third do but 
He's a really good between the tackles runner. He can push the pile. He's got good, solid hands out of the backfield. Again, not a guy that's going to be running wheel routes and doing Alvin Kamara type things, but he can catch the football. He's a reliable pass catcher, and he's solid in pass protection as well. This is a player that's played a lot of snaps in the NFL. He does a lot of things well. The Seahawks like in their offense. You know Pete Carroll likes ball carriers that are good between the tackles and run with physicality and toughness. You are going to get all of those boxes checked off with Wayne Gallman. So I like this addition on their practice squad, a player that can probably get up to speed very quickly, might be able to play this upcoming weekend because he's a veteran. He's played in multiple different types of systems. And it's a position, again, as I mentioned yesterday, that you can have guys come in with less practice time and they can get up to speed just because it's an easier position to do so. But Gallman's got a chance to be able to play this week. They've still got Darwin Thompson, as you mentioned, uh, Godwin Iguibuke as well on their practice squad. So they've got a number of different types of backs available there that can fill in, but they're hoping that their other running backs that are banged up are going to have a chance to be able to play as soon as possible and aren't going to be out very long, particularly Ken Walker the third, who's been such a big part of this offense that's taken over for Rashad Penny as a starter. One other roster move of note today, Josh Jones heading to injured reserve. Hamstring injury forced him out of the game in the first half on Sunday He's now going to miss at least the next four games. So really, most of the rest of the regular season, Josh Jones is going to be out. And this really makes the addition of Jonathan Abram that much bigger of a deal for the Seahawks, especially considering we don't know if Ryan Neal is going to be available this upcoming weekend, not only dealing with the elbow issue he played with last week, but also had a bursa sack in his knee, and he's still got a sore knee, according to Coach Pete Carroll. Neal thinks he's going to play, but... They probably are pretty happy that they won that waiver claim to bring in Jonathan Abram, and he's got a good chance to make his debut this weekend. Yeah, he does. And I think this is the perfect team in the Carolina Panthers for him to get his Seahawks debut just because of the fact that, you know, Carolina is going to want to run the football. And Abram um, is a big physical safety who is at his best coming downhill in run support. So to me, this is a relatively soft landing for the Seahawks, considering the fact that they did lose Josh Jones, obviously, on the heels of Ryan Neal struggling a little bit with his own durability, showing a great deal of toughness, uh, but still has been a little bit nicked up this year. And obviously with Jamal Adams going down as well. One other thing real quick on the running backs. You hit the nail on the head there, Corbin, with the, just the the loss of the straight line speed that the Seahawks had. Obviously, with Shrub Penny at 235 pounds, was running in the four fours. Um, with, with Kenneth Walker, the third, was running in the fourth threes. All of the backs on, on Seattle's roster, practice squad and active roster, all of them are four six type of guys. They are going to run hard. They are very physical. They do have good hands. They can pass protect. They can do just about every single thing that you need running backs to be able to do, but they are not likely to break away big. So it's going to make it that much more critical for Geno Smith and the Seattle's passing attack to continue to do very, very well for Seattle to get this win. And I will say this, if Wayne Gallman does get to play at Loman Field, that's where he had his best game. And Seahawks fans, this is going to give you a little bit of nightmares back in 2020. But when the Giants won that Colt McCoy game, 17 to 12, big reason they won that game was Wayne Gallman had a career high 135 rushing yards. And he actually busted a couple big runs in that game. Long stride. So if he does get an open field, he can surprise you a little bit with his speed. But again, he's a 4'6 guy doesn't have breakaway track speed or anything like that, but he has shown the Seahawks they've experienced firsthand that he can generate some big plays. And if he gets to play for the Seahawks now, maybe he'll have an opportunity to do that wearing blue and green instead. Coming up next is tell the truth Tuesday. Rob and I are going to dish out our final takeaways, maybe a few hot takes coming out of Sunday's win over the Rams. We'll get to those here in a moment on our Tuesday edition of locked on Seahawks. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. As you gear up for the busy holiday season, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. And LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. As a former site manager and current podcast host, I've made plenty of hires over the years, and LinkedIn has always been a go-to for me to find top candidates in sports media. Create a free post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network. Add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word you're hiring so your network 
can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown NFL. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. You're listening to Tell the Truth Tuesday here on the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks to all the 12s out there for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. And for your second listen, make sure to check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast from the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports. Go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Rob, we're going to be shifting gears towards week 14 here in a moment, but let's have one last chance to look back at week 13, maybe some reflection on where the Seahawks are at with five games left to play. It's Tell the Truth Tuesday, dishing out some takeaways, maybe some hot takes. Going to start with you, I'm sure, on the offensive side of the football you and I were talking before the show, and one of Seattle's top draft picks has had a really good season, but you do have one major red flag on his game that he th- you think needs to be fixed up here with five games left to play. Yeah, it's one of the things that I was concerned about with Charles Cross, just uh, you know, when Seattle selected him, um, is that while he is nicknamed Sweet Feet, um, and I think very appropriately, just considering how light and agile that he is on his feet, at the same time, I just don't see the heavy hands, the the, the physicality in his upper body, at least not consistently, that I'd like to see. And it was a little concerning against the Los Angeles Rams. I think that we, we talked about that we expected to see big plays from Bobby Wagner. We expect to see big plays from Leonard Floyd, from Jane Ramsey, from Taylor Rapp. It was Michael Hoyt, a Canadian football player, former defensive tackle at Brown Ivy League school, who was standing up pass rusher for the Rams, had three tackles, a tackle for loss, two sacks, a forced fumble at Geno Smith. At times, he took Charles Cross to school a little bit, and a big part of that was the way that he was using his hands. He had some nice push-pull moves. He had some nice overarm swim moves. He, he made some moves with his hands, was able to get around Charles Cross, even though he is not the same caliber of athlete, although Hoyt is a pretty good athlete himself. But still, the way that he beat Charles Cross was with his hands. And considering the fact that Carolina has two terrific pass rushers in uh, Brian Burns and then Uchur Gross Matos, two players we were very, very high on both of them in the draft process. Both of them have great feet, but they also have very quick hands as well. That is something that every opponent who is going to face the Seahawks is going to watch that tape, see how Michael Hoyt got his first two sacks of this season against the first round pick. And that's something that you can expect that other opponents are going to try to exploit of Seattle's rookie. We're going to go from discussing one of the most physically gifted, at least in terms of pound for pound players on Seattle's roster and Charles Cross. He is nicknamed Sweet Feet appropriately for that reason. Former basketball background, he is really light on his feet. We're going to go from him to a player that is a really good athlete. You have to be to be an NFL running back. But I think in terms of getting the most out of his talent, I think we've got to mention DJ Dallas as the player that checks that box off for the Seahawks. I don't know that there is a player on this roster that gets more out of his pure ability than what Dallas does. And I'm not just talking running the football. And this is not a guy that runs in the four fours, as we just talked about in the first quarter. He's one of those running backs in this group that runs in the four sixes, which is still a lot faster than most human beings. But for an NFL running back, that is average at best speed. He is not a burner. He's not a guy that's super shifty. He can surprise you at times, but he doesn't have the elite athletic traits. He's a short, stockier back that actually catches the football really well. He's just got a little bit of a unique skill set for the build that he has. And yet you have to admire the way that this kid just goes out there. And I talked about earlier playing that whole second half on a high ankle sprain and he played well. Like there were a few punishing runs in there where he picked up six or seven yards that contributed to scoring drives. He picked up a blitz. This was before his injury, but he picked up a blitz from Leonard Floyd on that touchdown throw from Geno Smith to Tyler Lockett. That touchdown does not happen unless he picks up that blitz and washes Floyd down as he did. And the plays he makes on special teams 
maybe not the best threat to return a kick or a punt, but he is reliable back there. He catches the football, and he, he'll surprise you sometimes on kick returns with the juice that he brings to the table. I just think in terms of bringing the complete package that DJ Dallas, with the talent he possesses, he gets the most that he possibly can out of it. And there have been times I think he's played so hard that he's ended up making some mistakes. I believe it was him a few years ago that kicked a football off the field. He's done some things that weren't necessarily the smartest because he is so competitive and he plays so hard. But you have to love what he gets out of his talent. And he is an invaluable contributor. I thought he was their unsung hero on Sunday. Well, I would certainly agree with that. I thought just the competitiveness with which he plays, I, I think, uh, makes him even more valuable than his athletic ability. Uh, you know, would would naturally allow you to think. Um, so, I, I certainly agree with, with uh, your assessment of DJ Dallas. And, and, and frankly, with DJ Dallas, I, I think that because he does offer so much as a, a back who can pass protect, he can catch balls out of the backfield. And again, being a returner, I think that was a big reason why Seattle brought in Wayne Gallman, just because he offers that similar type of versatility. But I, I don't know that Wayne Gallman necessarily had to be somebody that Seattle signed, just because I personally am really intrigued by what the Seahawks have in Tony Jones Jr. And it kind of goes back to his days at Notre Dame. I mean, like most players who sign with the Irish, um, you know, he was an exceptionally highly rated prospect. Um, and, you know, that's one of the knocks on Notre Dame guys is sometimes they get there and they are so lavish with praise. I mean, football is such a huge thing at Notre Dame, of course, that, that sometimes they don't always come in with the mental toughness of some of the players at other programs or the physical toughness, things like that. I don't think that's the case with Tony Jones. This is a guy who had to earn his way to becoming a starter. His senior season, we finally got his opportunity. He was spectacular. I mean, he ran for 176 yards, a career high in the um, in the rivalry game against USC. Um, he had a, an 84-yard touchdown run, the longest in Notre Dame Bowl history um, in, in the Camping Bowl win victory over Iowa State, a team that knows something about running the football as well. When Tony Jones Jr. has had his opportunities, he really has excelled in those opportunities. He just doesn't have that elite straight line speed. Again, this is a 4-6 guy like we talked about before. He is not the shiftiest of guys left to right. But some of the catches, some of the runs that he had against the Rams, just the same way that you highlighted DJ Dallas and his toughness, I was really impressed by Tony Jones Jr. in the way that he kind of seized that opportunity. I feel confident even though Carolina is a pretty solid defense and some hard hitters, I do feel confident that Seattle has a running back that can seize that opportunity if the Seahawks do need him to do so you mentioned earlier the Panthers run game and we're going to have a lot of chances to talk about that you would think that that would be a weak point after trading away Christian McCaffrey but Foreman has had a, a rejuvenation season in Carolina and they got a couple other solid running backs as well and I bring that up for my second take here because Bruce Irvin has been really good for the Seahawks since they brought him out of what was basically an unofficial retirement he was sitting at home chilling till the fifth week of the season, and they worked him out, signed him. And I think Irvin's been a nice addition, the leadership he brings in. I think he's done some nice things on the field. But I'm going to say this right now. There is no way that Bruce Irvin should be playing more snaps than your second-round pick, Boye Mafe. Now, if Mafe had not played well and flashed, then maybe I can you know, understand playing Irvin more. But at this point, with the way the stats are lined up, Playing Mafe less than Irvin, in my opinion, is defensive malpractice. This is supposed to be a rebuild year, and I know that they're on track to make the playoffs, but this is still a very young team. You are building towards the future while you're still trying to make the playoffs this season. That is a perfect scenario, but boy, Mafe played 10 snaps on Sunday, Rob, and he wasn't injured. That didn't make any sense to me, and true media, I looked at the stat today on the Five run plays that the Rams had when Mafe was on the field, they had 20 yards, four yards per carry. That's still decent, but their EPA was negative 0.5. When Mafe was off the field, they averaged 5.7 yards per carry, had almost 130 rushing yards, and their defensive EPA dropped to almost negative five. So we're talking a huge jump there. And Bruce Irvin was on the field a lot of those plays. I still think Irvin can be a key contributor for this team in a reserve role, but I think he's playing too many snaps right now and it's impacting his play. I think you're seeing a 35-year-old outside linebacker on the field that, quite frankly, 
isn't in tune to be able to play starter level snaps at this point in his career. Boy, Mafe should be getting those snaps, in my opinion. And the results have shown in the field. We've seen how he's held the edge. Irvin has really struggled the last couple of games with that. I do think a big part of that is, quite frankly, he is playing more snaps than what his body is ready to handle at this point in his career. I think it's malpractice. Number 53 needs to be in the lineup more. Yeah, I think that's well, well put. Uh, I think that Bruce Irvin, you know, has the heart of a champion. Um, at the same time, his body is physically breaking down a little bit at this point. I mean, we see the flashes, but he is, you know, playing a little bit of wild man football out there and, and just making some decisions, freelancing a little bit. And it's great when it works, but there were too many times where it did not work against the Los Angeles Rams for the Rams as, as beaten up as they were to still be able to run the ball as effectively as they did. And I know that it wasn't all the running back. Obviously it was a lot of jet sweeps. There's a lot of quarterback bootlegs and things like that, but still, the, the Carolina Panthers are going to be able to do the same thing, and certainly so will the San Francisco 49ers in a couple of weeks. So I do agree with you. I think you got to go with the younger player who physically is better capable of holding up at the point of attack. You are going to lose some pass rush, but I think a fresher Bruce Irvin, kind of like Daryl Taylor, is going to be a little bit more effective in that regard. Get Boye Mafe out there to hold up at the point of attack and be able to slow up that running game. And while I've been kind of critical about some of the things here with the Seahawks, I definitely want to kind of end on a higher note, and that is with Tariq Woolen. I mean, Corbin, kind of like we talked about yesterday with Geno Smith and how just game in, game out, I just continue to be amazed by how well that Geno Smith is playing on offense. I continue to be amazed with how well Tariq Woolen is playing on defense. There have been some spectacular defensive performances so far this season from a lot of different rookies. Aiden Hutchinson, um, you know, Sauce Gardner, of course. They, they've been spectacular. Trayvon Walker, number one overall pick for Jacksonville, certainly has shown flashes as well. But I would really put Tariq Woolen's tape up against anybody um, in, in terms of the rookies. And I really think that he is putting up all pro type of numbers. The two pass deflections that he had were even more impressive than the six interception, of course, a rookie Seahawk um, a, a record for this franchise. I mean, he just really has been remarkable in so many different ways. Really interested to see how he performs against Carolina because their receivers are a completely different style than some of the other guys that uh, Woolen has been asked to cover here in the last several weeks. Well, we know that DJ Moore is going to be a test. One of the most underrated receivers that quite frankly hasn't had good quarterbacks throwing to him for the last couple of years, really since the beginning of his career when Cam Newton was winding down in his time in Carolina. And I thought it was interesting that Pete Carroll after the game was basically hinting, yeah, he got beat a few times. And, you know, sometimes it's good to be lucky. And sometimes it's good to be 6'4 with 4'2'6 speed and long arms. On that one play that was underthrown a little bit by Wolford, he was able to get a really nice pass breakup in part because his recovery speed and his length at his size, that's a cheat code. And he's taken advantage of it. And that's one reason that he has been so darn good this year. But let's not discount what he's doing in the field. He is playing at an all-pro caliber level. I want to stay on the defense real quick. We're talking, we're throwing out these words, spectacular, extraordinary, and we're talking Tariq Woolen. I think we got to say the same thing about Chenna Nuosu. Now, I know we had two quiet games against the Raiders and the Buccaneers, only one quarterback hit. Some of that was the quarterbacks that were playing get rid of the ball so fast, but he is nearly to 10 sacks already, which would be double his career high. He just turned 26 years old at the beginning of the season. Aside from Geno Smith, who I think obviously has to be priority number one, even though Nuosu signed a two-year contract this past offseason and will have another year left in his deal, he's making money every single game out there right now. He is a perfect fit for the scheme they are playing. That has been one hell of an addition in free agency. He should be that second priority. You get Geno Smith extended, and then I think you need to extend Nuosu with a four-year contract Make him one of the foundational pieces of this defense because not only is he making big plays, he's one of those players that seems to step up to the plate and swing a big stick in clutch situations. Just think about Sunday. His two sacks both came when the Rams were threatening to score touchdowns. One of them moved the ball back to third and 16 on a strip sack, and the Rams were lucky they recovered it, got a field goal out of it. And the second one, they had the ball at the Seahawks' eight-yard line in the fourth quarter, and Nuosu again gets a sack, 
pushed the Rams back and they had to settle for another field goal. He took possibly eight points off the board for the Rams, which would have been the difference in this football game. And he had that fumble that he forced in the Broncos game in week one. It just seems like his big plays happen in crucial moments more times than not. Those kind of players, you got to pay them. And this guy should be priority number two right behind Geno Smith, in my opinion. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at Seattle's upcoming opponent, the Carolina Panthers, set to come to Lumen Field this weekend for a Week 14 clash. What's new in Carolina? We'll take a look at additions, departures, draft picks, and much more. Coming up next here on our Tuesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is releasing a slate of new football podcasts we're sure you're going to love. Find Block Forever now wherever you get your podcast. Block Forever is a brand new podcast from former NFL All-Pro Ryan Khalil and Audible. Khalil takes the conversation about football to the next level by giving football fans an insider's look at the game through the eyes of the greatest players and personalities of all time. Khalil sits down with star players, coaches, and former pros across the league to get real about what happens on the field as well as behind the scenes, inside the locker rooms, during team meetings, and back at the hotel. You'll hear from Christian McCaffrey as he talks about his love-hate relationship with fantasy football and Juju Smith-Schuster as he gives his most honest opinions on other players and positions in the league. Catch the full Block Forever series available anywhere you get your podcast. Available everywhere now. Audible. Get in the game. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad, as always, to be joined by my co-host in crime. Rob Rang. A special thanks to all the 12s out there for making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. And for your second listen, make sure to check out the Locked on Sports Today podcast. They've got the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Finally, time to move on. Seattle getting the win on Sunday over the Rams, but you got to have short memory when you're talking about football, and it's time to turn the page. Seattle needs to keep winning football games to keep pace with the San Francisco 49ers in the NFC West. And they've got an opponent coming up this weekend. The Carolina Panthers have been through so much turmoil. They fired a head coach earlier this season. They've changed quarterbacks as much as most people change clothes. It has been a difficult season in Charlotte. And yet, Rob, this team has been playing a lot better football for interim coach Steve Wilkes. Sam Darnold looked really good in his first start beating Russell Wilson a couple weeks ago. So there's a lot of optimism coming out of Charlotte, even though this team's probably not a playoff team. They are in the NFC South, so they're technically still in it to battle for that division. They've got plenty to play for, and it's not going to be an easy pushover game for the Seahawks coming up on Sunday. Not at all. I mean, this game to me reminds me a little bit of the Las Vegas Raiders game when Las Vegas came into town and, you know, everybody just looked at, at the Raiders record and just thought, oh, this is going to be an easy victory. I, I look at the individual talent for Carolina. And to me, this is a spooky one in a lot of different ways. Now, if we just kind of, for those on the YouTube are watching on YouTube and as Corbin always says, and thank you so much to all of our viewers and listeners out there. Um, but for those who are not watching you to quickly some of the additions for the Carolina Panthers. You already mentioned that they have a new head coach now in Steve Wilkes and the Panthers seem to be playing a lot better for them. They also have a new starting quarterback in Sam Darnold, obviously releasing Baker Mayfield, who, oh, by the way, signed with the Los Angeles Rams today. Uh, but they have the offensive lineman, Austin Corbett, Xavier Woods, the, the safety, Johnny Hecker, punter, Ike Mkwanu, Ike Mkwanu, the only offensive lineman that Seattle had a higher grade on than Charles cross um, and then Bradley Bozeman big physical center inside departures of course Christian McCaffrey quarterback Baker Mayfield Hassan Riddick the edge rusher Stefan Gilmore corner and then Matt Rule of course departure the aforementioned head coach now at University of Nebraska so there have been a whole bunch of additions and subtractions to me one of the most fascinating elements of this game Corbin is actually a guy who is off the field and Pete Carroll kind of talked about what a big game it was against the Los Angeles Rams because, of course, he was going back to L.A. where he won a national championship with the USC Trojans, knows the McVay family so very well. So it was kind of personal. Well, the same thing for the general manager returning back to Seattle, Scott Fitter of the Carolina Panthers. This game is going to be personal for him as well. And again, I think the Carolina Panthers actually match up pretty well with Seattle. You have a quarterback in Sam Darnold, who, of course, played at USC as well. He would love to beat Pete Carroll. To me, this is a really fun matchup. Can't wait to break it down today and tomorrow. 
Yeah, I think this is a team that is a dangerous team under 500 right now. They had a couple games they let slip away. They could be hovering around 500 if they would have found a way to win those games. The one that went to overtime on a Hail Mary from P.J. Walker and then the Falcons won in overtime a few weeks ago. Uh, the fact they lost that game because they ended up missing the extra point. I mean, it's been that kind of a season. And you and I were joking about it before the show, but really it isn't a joke. I mean, there's probably going to be a roster move made by the Panthers – by the time we get done with this segment, because they have had more change than any team in the NFL, whether it's firing coaches, dismissing quarterbacks that you traded for, bringing in other quarterbacks, uh, changing offensive linemen, defense has had a bunch of guys in down the line. I mean, they just are constantly changing. Christian McCaffrey going to the 49ers. This has been an up and down topsy turvy season for a team that's clearly heading into another rebuild, and yet. They're still on the playoff hunt. And so I do think that this is a dangerous team. They've got nothing to lose, and they've been playing a lot better as of late. I think Seattle's got the more talented team. But nonetheless, I mean, with all the losses that Carolina's had, there's some really good players we had on that list there in terms of departures. And a couple of them been gone in the middle of the season. McCaffrey, Mayfield didn't work out for Carolina, didn't get a chance to get his job back. Now he's going to be with the Rams. But still, there's a lot of talent there that is no longer on the roster, and yet this team has been playing pretty good football, and they've got a lot of good young talent, particularly when it comes to rushing the passer. You mentioned Yitor Gross Matos earlier, Brian Burns, and then the inside, they've also got uh, Derek Brown. I mean, this team has got a lot of really good first and second round talent on that defensive line. So trying to protect Geno Smith, that'll be something we talk about a little bit on Matchup Wednesday tomorrow. But I certainly look at this roster, and I think some of the youth that the Panthers have, again, this is the kind of team that you don't want to take lightly because they don't have anything to lose. They're young guys that don't know any better. Those are the kind of teams that can come into your home stadium and not be distracted by the noise and go out and beat you similar to what the Raiders did. They had some young guys really step up in that game in Carolina. They maybe don't have quite as much star power as the Raiders, but this is still a team that has a lot of talent and going off the young players. I think we've got to talk a little bit more about the draft class here. And I know this is what you get most excited about. If Matt Corral wouldn't have got hurt before the season started, we might be seeing him playing against Geno Smith in this game with the way the quarterback situations played out. Unfortunately, he's missed the entire season. He won't play this year. But Iki Aquanu has played really well for the Panthers. Looks like a franchise left tackle already. Brandon Smith, a linebacker out of Penn State that I really liked. He was just playing special teams, but he is starting to get some snaps on defense and making some plays. I wouldn't be shocked if he plays a lot of snaps on defense this game, and he is a super athletic linebacker that can rush the passer. He can play some coverage. So they've got some young guys. J.C. Horn on the outside, their first rounder two years ago at corner. Uh, they've got Chin, the former safety from Southern Illinois. I mean, this team has got a lot of really good young, talented players they've drafted in the last two or three years. And so, again, that makes them a dangerous team, even though they don't have a good record. They don't have an offense that scores a ton of points. They've still got plenty of pieces. You can't take this team lightly, or you might find yourself seven and six coming out of week 14. Yeah. And again, I, I mentioned this before with the, the revenge factor, the, you know, make, taking it personal factor. And I was kind of, you know, kind of tongue in cheek there with the general manager, Scott Fitter. Obviously, he's not going to be putting points on the board for the Carolina Panthers. But with, with the Las Vegas Raiders, as I mentioned before, it was their explosive offense that I was very concerned about from a Seattle perspective. It is the Carolina Panthers defense that I am most concerned about from Seattle's perspective. And again, a big part of that would be the guys who are going to come back to Seattle. You have Frankie Luvu, who played his college ball at Washington State. And then he, of course, is going to be frank, uh, flanked excuse me, by Shaq Thompson and Corey Littleton, two former University of Washington Huskies. The entire linebacking core is a bunch of guys who played their college ball here in the state of Washington. And so, again, considering the fact that Seattle is going to have a brand new running back, uh, you know, at, you know, starting this game, presumably, um, and we know that Seattle's offense in terms of passing attack has been just humming so far. But still, with the corners that you just mentioned, J.C. Horn and then, um, you know, C.J. Henderson, former first round pick that the Panthers made a trade for. For. I mean, this is a talented team. And again, the pass rush is, is a good one as well. So again, I really think this is going to be a fascinating matchup in a lot of different ways, a lot more, a lot closer than the record would suggest this game should be. 
Yeah, their recent games, this team has been playing really good football, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. Now, they have had a few games get away from them. Cincinnati wiped the turf with them a few weeks back. So this is a team that if you can get off to a fast start, they don't have the offensive firepower to be able to come back that, say, a team like the Raiders did a few weeks ago. But still, it is not an opponent you can take lightly. And with that being said, I'm really fired up about matchup Wednesday coming up tomorrow because, again, this Panthers team has a lot of talent on both sides of the football, particularly on defense. So that's going to be really fun breaking down their defense going against Seattle's offense coming up in this Week 14 matchup. As always, you can follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Check out Locked On Seahawks and Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and, of course, we're streaming five days a week on YouTube. We'll have matchup Wednesday coming tomorrow, a fierce Panthers defense, a lot of talent in that front seven and in the secondary going up against a high-powered Seahawks offense. A lot of fun matchups to break down. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thanks for listening. Go Hawks.